Welcome to America's Top Rebbitzins. May this class be for Rafua Shalema, for Dove Ben Makalea, Rachel Badhaya Alice, Itai Ben Ahuva, and Yaakov David Natan Ben Sarah Ben, ben Sarah Hana. Please click on the subscribe button to subscribe to us on the America's Top Rebbitzins YouTube page, or click follow to follow us on your podcasting app so that you are the first to know when an inspiring new episode is posted. I'm very happy to have on today's show Sarah Carmelli. Sarah is a world-renowned educator and author who has been speaking to audiences and counseling people for over 20 years. Her expertise is in the field of family purity, relationships, love, and marriage, and her talks emphasize traditional Jewish marriage and family ideals. Thank you so much for being here. Please tell us more about yourself and what you do. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with other distinguished Robertsons who you interviewed. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm basically a teacher, also speaker. I'm happy to say that uh, I enjoy the work I do. I've gone around the world speaking and teaching. Australia and uh, South, America, South Africa, South America, uh, Thailand, many all over the world, and I enjoy what I do. But all over the world, anywhere I am, they all everybody wants the same thing: how to have a better relationship how to strengthen ourselves, be it men or women, because I do also speak for couples. Uh, I wrote two books that have been translated into different languages, stories to hear with your heart and words to hear with your heart. Anybody who would like a signed copy, feel free to contact me. Um, I'll give you my number and uh, my email. Uh, what I, I teach brides, which I enjoy very much. I'm doing this now for oh, nearly 40 years. It was many, many years ago and I moved to this country and uh, I was teaching brides because the rabbi in my community asked me to. And then I became very nervous. Although I took a lot of courses, I said, I don't think I could do this because it's a bigger price, it's a big responsibility. If I teach something wrong or they don't do it right, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna do this. So I told the Lubavitcher Rebbe and he told me very, very forcefully, not only you can do this, but you must do this. And I want to be partners with you. And this was wow. 40 years ago. He gave me $15 for that group of women. Wow. 14 women and myself made 15. So since then, I take it very seriously to teach brides, not just about Tarata Mishpacha, which is good, but about how to have a marriage the way it's supposed to be. Not just the wedding night is one night. It's an important night. <laughs> but to focus more on the marriage rather than just only the wedding night. I do counseling also. People come to me for counseling. I like to do that as well. I enjoy what I do. That's amazing. And I will, in the um, podcast description, I'm going to include your email. So if anybody wants to contact you directly, they'll have that information. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So um, as you mentioned, you, you love teaching about love and marriage and relationships, and we're really going to get into it today. I'm so excited. We have a very great show coming up. So family is a central component of Judaism. It's the core of our life and the survival of our future. We all want happy and loving and fulfilling marriages, but we sometimes experience bumps in the road. So these bumps or challenges are meant to help us grow and become stronger. And today, our goal is to help couples overcome some of their harder challenges but by providing them with wisdom and guidance. We're going to be answering some really hard questions that need to be addressed, but that are not often talked about. So first, let's start at the beginning. When a Jewish man and woman get married, their first priority in their marriage is to establish Shalom Bayis. Can you please explain to us really what Shalom Bayis is all about and what it actually looks like in a happy, healthy marriage? Absolutely. And I agree with what you said. Shalom Bayis, what does it mean? Let's analyze Shalom means peace, Bait means home. Now, the word Shalom is also one of God's names. God has many names. So when you have Shalom, God, in your Bait, you have everything. When I say that I really believe marriage is what you make of it, it sounds very simplistic, but it's really true. I've seen couples getting married madly in love, madly in lust, and say, make me happy. No, it doesn't work. Marriage means what? I believe respect brings love. Love doesn't always bring respect. So marriage means what? It's not 50-50. It's 200-200. It's what I do, my 100, and my husband's 100. Doesn't mean to say that I'm a schmatter, that I just lose myself in him. But I'm there to make the marriage the way it's supposed to be, peace and harmony. It's actually written, when you have peace in your home, you have all the blessings. 
which means you have the blessing of money. Because in the Mishnah it's written, what's the best kli, what's the best vessel to contain God's money? Contains his shalom by. So when that sh- vessel, that shalom is broken, money just disintegrates. Health is enhanced when you have shalom by. Because I hope nobody should know what happens when there's an argument. I'll tell you what happens when there's an argument. Headache, stomachache, chest pain. I can't think of anything else except the fight with my husband. It does affect the health. It's not psychosomatic. It does affect the health. And also we know it affects our children. People don't realize children pick up and listen and get influenced by the parents. If it's not even arguing, atmosphere in the home, you know, the energy. Most places I've gone to speak, they let me to speak to children, all ages, universities or smaller children, boys, girls. Every time I've gone without fail, I'll have some children, boys or girls, raising their hands, I will never get married. Who needs married, turned off for life? Yes, because they remember their parents argue and it affects them terribly. Give your children what they really need, more than the exercises and the, ju- and the judo and the, the toys. Give them a peaceful home, security to know mom and dad are together. It doesn't have to be lovey-dovey in particular, respect. And I keep harping on the respect. Respect means really not to pull each other down, especially in front of the children. You have different opinion. It's okay. You're not two clones. How to express that with respect and with care. I like that. I really like that, that, that your emphasis on respect. And so I wanted, I would really want to try to paint a picture for everybody who's listening. What does it look like, uh, like a, a home, when you walk into a home that has real, true, authentic shalom bias, what does that respect look like? How, how does it play out? I like that question. I'm very sensitive to, uh, I mean, it sounds like a new age, but I'm very, very sensitive to energy in a home. When I walk into a home, I, without wanting to, I can always immediately tell if there's fights, if there's not fights, because people, the tension in the air, and again, children pick up on it, the husbands pick up, the wives pick up on it. So a marriage means really making the home as it's supposed to be, a miniature beta mikdash. And woman is the coin gadol. What do I mean by that? <laughs> home is a miniature beta mikdash. And our home, when you think of it this way, a home is something to be, to be made holy and also to be basimcha. How is a woman a Kohen Gadol, high priest? She has the same role in different format. When she lights the Shabbos candles, it's like the, the Kohen Gadol lighting menorah in the Beth Amigdash. When she has on the Shabbos tables two halas, six braids and six ways makes 12. And the Beth Amigdash has 12 showbreads with 12 shvatim. And of course, when she keeps the laws of Tarat to Mishpacha, she's bringing the ultimate blessings and sacrifices not, I don't mean in a bad way, sacrifice. It means the offerings to Hashem by bringing purity in the home. And make no mistake about it. Shalom Bayit and Taras Mishpacha are connected. I'm happy to say that I belong to a wonderful organization, actually two, mikvah.org and also Mikvah USA are doing amazing jobs in building mikvahs all over the world and bringing mikvah teachers to teach that. So I'm very happy and proud to say I belong to them. They're doing an amazing job. And I think anybody who wants to give donations, that's a place to give it. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so funny that you mentioned um, Mikva USA. We had um, Hannah Weisberg on. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if anybody's interested in, in a real, like um, in an interview about Mikva and what it's all about, check out that interview with Hannah Weisberg. Um, but so unfortunately, many couples have difficulty creating shalom bias in their homes. And one reason for this can be if a husband or wife is very controlling. They want to know where their spouse is going at all times, who they will be with, how much money they spent and what they bought. They call the other person frequently throughout the day to keep tabs on them and they monitor whom they speak with on the phone. And this type of situation can be very, very harmful to a marriage. So I want to see what advice you can give to people who are dealing with a controlling spouse. Very good question. The obvious answer is obviously counseling, but sometimes the husband or the wife, whoever the controlling one is, refuses to go to counseling. It's not my problem, it's your problem. So I would like to suggest a wonderful, wonderful idea they could do, anybody who has any issues in a marriage. If you do this, they won't need to go for counseling. 
that we need to go to shrinks. Okay, once a week, this is my advice. Once a week, you can choose any evening you like. I think Motzeh Shabbos is a good time. You can choose that once a week to husband and wife sit together, put the children to bed, turn down the lights and have in front of you two little candles and whatever drink you like, tea, coffee or whatever it is you like. And then you take turns. 10 minutes or maybe 15, one at a time. For example, the wife starts first to tell the husband there's one thing she wants or that she does not want. And he's not allowed to interrupt. He's not allowed to say, what do you mean by that? And then his turn. And he tells her, honey, would you mind from now not doing? It has to be one thing that she wants or that you don't want. Something doable, something practical. Believe me, if you do this once a week, you clear up a lot of rancor, a lot of problems. One woman actually told me she started to do this. And she called me, she told me that her husband said or did something during the week. And she was very upset and she was ready to rip into him. She said, no, I'm going to wait for our session. She said, Sarah, when the time of my session came, I thought, I'm so upset about that. And it just, just it became nothing. So please, please, please realize, anyone who's listening to this, when there's an, any form of issue in a marriage that really bothers you, like what you mentioned, control. Yes. Run for help. You're not allowed to just take it and take it until you just explode. That doesn't work. So you go for help. But who can you go to help for? Right. A, shpia, a rabbi, someone you know that your husband, I'm assuming it's the husband, but it could be also the wife. Either way, you go to somebody who your spouse looks up to, respects, would listen to, and ask them to please to explain to the person. Control, obviously it means that the person who's controlling has an issue themselves. Right. They will not be doing this. It comes from some sort of insecurity, but be that as it may, it's not a right thing to do because in the end it works. It makes the other person who's been controlled just want to break out and run away. So it's not a good thing to have. Exactly, exactly. And it's so interesting because I really like what, what you're talking about to once a week, just to sit down calmly, quietly, just the two of you without without the laundry or paying the bills or the kids or I have to go here and there and just to focus on each other and just to take turns talking. I really, really like that. It's, it works. It really does work. And it's just it's almost like a um, an open form of communication for the both of them. Absolutely. I like and they can save up what they have to say for that session. And the person who's presenting it should be obviously, you know, to say it in, a, in the right way, right tone of voice, not in an angry way, because that's not going to work. But the other person will probably be surprised to know, I didn't know my wife felt like that. Or I didn't know my husband had that issue. You'll be surprised how many people tell me after they have no idea that their spouse felt that way. Because sometimes the spouse is a little bit nervous or scared to say it in case the spouse will be upset with them. That's so funny because you think, you know, you think your spouse, of course, he knows what he did wrong. It's obvious. Isn't it so clear? And oftentimes he has no idea, like no clue. Absolutely. They don't know. They'd... How's a man supposed to know? <laughs> what a woman? I mean, he's not a woman. Right. She's not a man. So it's okay. People say, oh, I don't understand my wife. Well, you know what? The part of her that you don't understand, you should love just as much as the part you do understand. Don't try to understand one another. Just accept one another when you can. When something is unacceptable, especially from any form of abuse, you run for help. It's not a mitzvah to be abused. Right. No, 100%. 100%. And also one last thing that I want to point out about this, this wonderful once a week kind of meeting is that it's also an illustration of respect because we were speaking about respect earlier. This is a great forum for respect because you're not standing there shouting at each other in the middle of the kitchen. You know, you're sitting down calmly and you're speaking to each other in a nice tone of voice and it's very, very respectful. And then the other person's more open to listening because they don't feel attacked. They don't feel yelled at and so important. And it's their chance also to express after. They don't have to feel as if they're being attacked. You know, especially men are kind of nervous to say things to their wives in case their wives will be annoying them. So it gives yeah. them a chance to sort of say, hey, do you mind if from now on, I don't know, you don't wear that red dress or you don't, we don't go to your mom and dad every single day. I mean, I'm just giving examples, you know, right. because many times, unfortunately, stress can be caused by family interference. That's one of the things, you know, True. intimate relations and many things could, um, could produce friction in the home. This is true. Um, and um and so I know that one of your family's specialties is family purity. So I really feel comfortable asking you this question. 
So husbands and wives, they may have different desires for physical intimacy at certain points in their marriage. So what is a couple to do if they end up having mismatched sex drives? Basically, it's actually, this is my strong point that I do actually do sessions on intimacy, especially for women who are from a background, they have no, no idea, you know, obviously in the from communities, they don't know. So what do you do when you're not in the mood? Shulchan Aruch says, when a husband sees his wife coming to bed, primping and getting all beautiful, that's a sign for him that he should be with her. What happens when she's not in the mood? And it does happen sometimes, hormones up and down, you know, a woman's not always maybe in the mood. There's, there's um, after having a baby, obviously, sometimes it happens that she's just too exhausted, maybe the hormones. She obviously should tell her husband, I'm not in the mood, I'm not in the mood, but you can make me. And please realize that the most erotic part of a person's body, especially a woman, is the brain. Yeah. When she's turned off in her mind, it's not going to happen. When she's with her husband, she should not think about tomorrow, what shall I cook? And I've got a carpool tomorrow, and what dress shall I wear? That should all go out of her mind. And there are actually ways of really working on a person um, to actually be able to feel and have more pleasure. pleasure of intimacy because pleasure in intimacy invites more pleasure after intimacy she should not refuse wow i like that can you I'll elaborate a little bit about that point then that that pleasure in intimacy brings even more pleasure than intimacy i think there's there's a lot there a lot of couples when they come to me and have issues like she doesn't want to be with him or maybe she's not interested in intimacy that's because she does not have pleasure so it stands to reason why should she want to be with the husband when they stands that he has pleasure but she doesn't so there are ways of working on that there's obviously halakhic ways and I actually specialize in that um, there are ways and there are ways that every woman is capable of have intimacy um, to, in, to enjoy intimacy so the full looks the same if you just look ish and isha ish is alef yud shin and almost alef shin hey meaning Ish, fire, the passion, which is the passion of intimacy, a man has a yud separating it. A woman has no separation in her, in her ish. So a woman is capable and will have more powerful, enjoyable, and passionate intimacy than a, than a man. People don't realize that. I think it's just a man. It's not true. If you look at what Ish and Isha, you realize the ish, the passion, the fire, a man has an interposition in it, women doesn't have that. And she's capable of having more powerful and enjoyable intimacy, which will lead to more intimacy when she's enjoying it. Of course, she's going to not say no. Wow. Okay. Okay. I understand that. But now like, I want to reverse it a little bit because sometimes, and it maybe doesn't happen often, but sometimes it happens, like where the woman wants to have more intimacy and the man doesn't. It's so amazing you saying that because... In the previous years, I would have women coming to me complaining, my husband wants to be with me all the time and I can't take it anymore. Now it's not like that. They come to me and they tell me, what shall I do? My husband doesn't have a cheshek. He doesn't, he, he doesn't want to have, he can, cannot or he's tired. I have that all the time for women who come to me now. I don't, is it because of the outside pressure, you know, making parnasa? I think it's also lack of zinc in the air, in, in the earth. Don't laugh, really. In Italy, they have plenty of zinc in the, in the earth, and the men are much more ready hot to trot than the <laughs> men in America. So I think when there's a problem with that, women can give zinc. You know, anything Hashem created in this world, it's for us, you don't, for us Jews. For example, Viagra. Viagra is not made created that people should come to have illicit relations. It's made for Shalom Bayek when a couple can, does not have uh, relations because the husband cannot or is not a, unable to. Because it does happen when a man is uh, depressed or he has um, certain physical problems, his virility is diminished. Yes. So what is that wife is supposed to do? Yes. Hashem created Viagra, especially for Shalom Bayek for a couple. That's what I believe. Viagra. <laughs> I mean, Everything Hashem created is for the is for mitzvah. Right. Why not just 
you know, use it when Hashem created such a thing, if it's going to help a couple, and, and it does many times actually it's helped children by such a couple because the husband is incapable because physically and medically he's incapable. Right. I mean, there are plenty of men, out, unfortunately, out there who have issues who cannot perform like they, they would like to. Yes. So Hashem gave us this gift. It's like a medication like any other. I like that. There's a lot to that. And I, I think it's so interesting about the zinc. I'm fascinated. I'm actually going to look it up because I've never heard that about the zinc before. About what? About the zinc. Yes, yes. Zinc really does make a difference. And for women, you know, the Benish High was a Savadi Mekubal 200 years ago. He wrote so many sparring for women because the women in Iraq, he's from Iraq. So the women in Iraq were notoriously late in having menopause and they stayed young and very wow. beautiful. And he, say, he teaches the women, for example, I'll give you an example. Every day they should eat at least one Majul date. You know, the fat dates, the juicy dates. Yes. At least one a day, because it's for the hormones, have things like turmeric, like certain spices, he would say, well, everyone should take this, because it really apparently helps a woman to keep her youth. And she should do things to keep herself young and beautiful. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that tip. That's great. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to ask an, another very interesting question. Um, a friend of mine was once given the advice to acknowledge the good that her husband does and accept his flaws and inconsistencies as part of who he is. So she was really given the advice of acceptance, like whoever he is, like with his flaws, you know, he's not making you, he's not doing this for you, doing that, but you just accept him as he is. And my question really is, what role does acceptance play in a marriage? And does accepting the other person for who he is really have the power to restore and revitalize a marriage? That's an excellent question. And I actually think it's amazing that if a couple can accept one another, in others, to really know, this is my husband. He has this issue. Maybe I was supposed to have that issue, but Hashem gave it to him instead. It's an amazing story. Of course, I can't say it now. It's too, it's too long a story to say, but we know for a fact that when a couple is created, 40 days before the white mothers conceived them, already it was destined they're going to marry one another. So Hashem created a soul, two halves, male half and female half. They come in this world and they separate under the hope of the rejoin. So whatever the spouse has, that said that husband has a certain issue, well, that he's really part of her nisham also. So she should accept the fact that, hey, maybe his issue is supposed to be my issue. So accept it with love and humor. Humor is a word we have to use all the time. Sense of humor, laugh about things. Now, I have to say this. Accepting is great. Accepting is wonderful. However, if it's something that really irks and bothers a woman or even a husband she she should not for example let's say a husband i mean i'm giving an example doesn't like to shower or doesn't like to brush his teeth or doesn't use deodorant. i'm just giving an example okay should she accept that if it bothers her to the point that she cannot be intimate with him because he's not didn't shower she can't accept that she should just in a loving way in a very kind way let him know if he would do this following thing, that shower or brush his teeth, it would be better for her to be with him. So they're accepting things that you cannot change. Obviously, you have to accept it because if you cannot change it, you cannot change it. But the things you can change, the only way you can change it or help it with love, patience, understanding, and a sense of humor to laugh about things. It really does work. A sense of humor is really, really important. And I also like that you differentiated, like there's some things that are not going to change. No matter what you do, it's not going to change. And those things you just have to accept. Otherwise, you're going to be banging your head against the wall. You're going to be fighting all the time for nothing, for absolutely nothing. You got it. You got it. Right. It just damages you. It just makes you ill because you're trying to change something you cannot change. Exactly. Exactly. And it was the story that you were thinking of to say, was it about the, the hunchback with the girl with the hunchback? Exactly. I would, you know what I would love if you shared, because I, I know this story and it's such a powerful story to illustrate the concept of what you're talking about, that the man and woman are one nishama. So I'll dip a kid, sir. Okay. Okay. This is a story about this um, young Lakala. She's waiting for her husband to come because the husband and Kala, they made a match between this uh, young man who's known to be brilliant, Tam Kokham, this young lady, you know, she was very special young lady and the wedding date was made and hadn't seen each other. Finally, the wedding day comes along. 
and the Kahal is upstairs in the bedroom peeping behind a curtain to see a first glimpse of a future Khosan. The, the carriages come rolling in. Finally, the last one comes. They say, the Khosan is here. The Khosan is here. The young man gets out of the carriage, walks across the courtyard and comes into the building. Well, she gives one look and she screams, locks her bedroom door and says, I'm not marrying him, send him away. I'm not getting, they tricked me, why? Because he was a hunchback, he was lame. And she was a, she's a healthy young lady. Her parents come up knocking on the door, what are you doing, come down, we're so embarrassed, I'm not marrying him. The rabbi comes up trying his luck, no luck. Finally, the young man, Nebuch, he says, can I go speak to her? Gesundheit, hey, go, she's not listening to her, she's gonna listen to you. He limps up the stairs and he knocks on her door. Go away, leave me alone. He says, look, I've come all this way to see you. Give me five minutes. And if you wish, I will leave. Something in his voice touches her. She unlocks the door. He walks in and he limps across the room and stands in front of a full length mirror. And he asks her, would you please come and stand next to me? She figured, oh, I'll humor him. She comes and stands next to him, turns around to see a reflection in the mirror. And she nearly faints. Goes, what does she see? She sees the young man next to her, no more a hunchback cripple, tall, husky, healthy young man. But she was the one with the hunchback. She was the one who's lame. She says, what does this mean? What's going on? What is this? He tells her, my precious future color. It was brochette in Shemai. It was meant in Shemai. That I was going to be the healthy one. You were going to be the one with the hunchback. Then my love for you, and my compassion for you, I asked Hashem, don't let it happen to her. Who's going to marry her like this? It happened to me, and here we are. Wow. <laughs> he teaches us, if and when I see a, a fault in my, my spouse, first of all, it's not even sneers. How dare I see a lack in my husband? But if I do and what I do, I have to look and say, maybe I have to have that. Like when Adam and Chava was created, if you check and you see it's written, Hashem put Chava, Hashem put Adam to sleep and he created a cover. What does this mean? Hashem is, is giving us a tip. He's saying, Adam pretended to be asleep, not to see his hair on a lack in the spouse. Sometimes I have to be a little bit like, I don't see that fault in my spouse. To have compassion instead of anger. Again, I'm, I'm, if anything really bothers a person to the extent that it really affects them, of course they should point out and say, would you mind, I don't know, when you eat, uh, don't slurp. I'm, I'm just going to a silly example. Things that really bother you, you can say that in the, in the weekly session. So that could be spoke about then, instead of just repressing everything. Because make no mistake, you press, repress, repress, it's going to come in a not right way. For sure, a big explosion, like after a while, and like, yeah, yeah, definitely. You don't want an explosion, you don't want to fight because nobody's going to be expecting that. And it's going to be scary, both for your husband and for your children, God forbid. Absolutely, absolutely. And I have no idea if they knew they would have taken care of it if they just told me, you know? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So here is actually a tough question. Uh, when people are at the end of the rope of their marriage, they have struggled for years. They've gone to therapy, they've spoken to rabbis, they've attended marriage workshops, and nothing has worked to improve their marriage. They often ask themselves, should I stay married just for the children? So I want to ask your thoughts. Can you please share your thoughts on that? Should a couple remain married just to keep the family together for their children? You know, it's such a good question, such a powerful, and there's no right answer because every marriage is different. However, if and when there's Hasso a marriage, this fighting and bitterness, anger, name calling, physical abuse, please don't expose your children to that and do them a favor. To, but however, if it's just something that you can deal with and go to therapy and work on it together, because I was, my motto is marriage is what you make of it. Right. You can get married and say, make me happy. It ain't going to last. If you think, what can I do? I like, for them, I, my husband loves He's Persian, he loves rice. I make him rice every day. I don't touch rice. He likes it. What does it cost me to do that? Why would I not do that to make him happy? Right. So if the marriage is to the point that it's poisonous and everybody's like, I've seen unfortunate cases of families, really the children went off the derrick because of that. They went on drugs, the girls became promiscuous. I'm not advocating divorce because I never ever advocate divorce. Unless God forbid there's a, 
you know, danger of somebody's life. And I, then I'll help. I've actually done, I've helped people, you know, when a couple has a knife pulled on them. Oh my God. I'm going to do something to help them. However, it's something that really can be worked on. Why is it so painful? Why is a marriage down to that level? Go for therapy, go for counseling, go to the right. Listen, when I say therapy, there are many therapists out there, not Jewish, get divorced. They say, just get divorced. Oh, but it's not so posh. It. You can work on it. You can definitely work on it because there must be very, very few things that really, I believe, um, necessitate divorce. Obviously, I mean, I can't even go into it, but I've seen couples coming to me and I thought they're definitely going to get divorced. And they worked on it and they were fine. You know, okay, it's, it's guys. not what you're accepting or what you really want the marriage to work. Right. Want it to work, it will. If you just give up and, in, and you have these unrealistic expectations, because when people get married, they have expectations. When I get married, my husband is going to be A, B, and C. And he's not. He's like that. But that's okay. That's your husband. Accept him for what he is because he can't change him. Don't try and change someone. You can accept the same time with a sense of humor, work together. And it, when I say intimacy brings shalom by, it's a fact. And nobody can deny that. Intimacy brings shalom by. So there's a whole big uh, you know, question about that. But yes, you can definitely work on a marriage. That's beautiful. You know, it's interesting. I've heard it. I've heard two things said about um, marriage and divorce, you know, when it comes to like really, really problem situations. It's like divorce is almost sometimes like jumping from the fire, from the frying pan into the fire, you know? So sometimes when things are really bad and I'm not denying it, you know, and like you said, there are certain situations where divorce is warranted, where people should get divorced. There really, really aren't. I don't want to belittle those situations because they exist, yes. you know, and I want to acknowledge them. But oftentimes, like when you have, you know, you're, you're in the frying pan, you're having your difficulties. And when you jump into the fire, they become worse, especially if you're children. And then they're at his house sometimes, and then they're at your house sometimes. And then the custody battles, I mean, you, you're coming into problems that you didn't have when you were in the frying pan, so to speak. And also, even more importantly, I've also heard it said, you know, if you're if you're in a marriage and you're really struggling with somebody's characteristic, their personal their personality you don't like, there's a character trait, there's something about them that you don't like, chances are that that personality trait is there for you to grow. And if you get divorced and God forbid you get married, you're going to find that trait in the other person. And I've actually seen this happen. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And I've actually seen that also with couples I remember one couple, I was begging her, don't do it, don't divorce. She did, and she got married again, and the second husband was worse. Oh. Was worse. And she told me after she, how much she regretted doing that. Right. Because the children suffered. When there's a divorce, they'll make it very, very rare that children accept, accept children. Usually they turn against both parents. They get very angry with them, and they think that it's it's big mess with the children. As you say, his children, her children, I mean, as again, there are times when you've got no choice. Right. You know, when there's dangerous yes. um, action and people, you know, should not just stay in an abusive relationship. When For I said sure. abusive, I mean, really, I don't mean just, oh, he wants me to cook him dinner, he's abusing me. That's right. not, <laughs> abuse is really, mental abuse, physical abuse. Emotional abuse to too. Their lives, danger to their lives. Yes, for sure. I've seen a woman stay in her marriage after the husband pulled a knife on her and, oh. they, were able, and they were able to fix the marriage because they went for therapy. Well, the therapy, he, only would only, he wouldn't go to therapy. The only person he would listen to was his uncle. And I spoke to the uncle and the uncle spoke to him and he, he uncle helped because he would not go for therapy. Right, right. That also happens. I'm really glad that you brought that up because sometimes like the woman wants to go to therapy. She'll go and do the research. She'll find the therapist and the husband will not go. Men will say, I'm fine. It's you, you go for therapy yourself. Nothing to do with me. You're, you're the one who needs help, not me. How many times I've heard that? Right, right. But it's really good that you brought up the point. Maybe it doesn't have to be exactly a therapist, a family friend, a relative, a respected member of the community. You know, you don't need like a therapist, like a qualified therapist. You just need somebody that the other person is going to listen to. Now, not every rabbi can be a therapist and not right. every therapist can be a rabbi. 100%. But sometimes you get these rabbis who are, br are brilliant and they know how to handle, I have a couple in, right now I can think of brilliant they know how to get the husband into shape and to talk to them especially yes. as a, a rabbi who actually married them off you know was able to 
to do what he's supposed to do. Yes, yes, exactly. I know a few of those two. They're really, really remarkable. Yes. Um, so I find that people, myself included, are often inspired by real life examples of people who have struggled in their marriage, did the hard work that it takes to keep a marriage together, and then pulled through better and stronger than ever. So I know that you've already shared a few stories with us, but do you have a story that you can, another story that you could share with us, maybe from your own personal life or from the life of somebody that you know that can really, really illustrate the point that if you really work on your marriage and you can successfully pull through the struggles? I'll tell you about myself okay this is more than that when I got married to my husband 56 years ago believe it or not wow you should know I lived in California when I was speaking to the same man you're married with the same man (laughs) so when we both got married I was very young he was young we were on the same page um in observance religious observance and of course what happens When I met Chabad, when I go into Chabad, I was going, I was like a born again, 100 miles an hour to keep everything and everything can imagine. My husband got very scared. He thought my wife is gone cuckoo. Now she's telling me, you know, get out of my bed. Tomorrow she's going to say, get out of the house. And when it was my time for my period, he didn't want to have two beds. And I needed, and I, he didn't want to have two, I wanted two beds, he wanted just one. I'm being very open. Um, And what happened was, I was going 100 miles an hour. I wanted to wear a shaitl and he didn't want, and I wanted to do this and he didn't want. It got to the point that was really, I'll be honest with you, I thought it's a mitzvah to divorce. So I can keep all the mitzvahs because he's not letting me. So I told the Lubavitcher Rebbe, isn't it true I should get divorced? Isn't it better this way like this? He's not letting me do all these things. And the Rebbe, like an Abba, like a father. My two stories, my two books, actually many stories are written about my experiences, how the Rebbe taught me of my own personal Shalom bias. And he kept telling me two, two tips he gave, one many tips, two tips I'll share. He told me, number one, don't fight about religion. What was happening when I was fighting with my husband about religion, because you know he wouldn't let me do certain things, it was disaster. Why? Because my husband would tell, to tell me, don't do such a thing, don't do such, don't cover your hair with a shit. And I would cry and whine. I said, you don't love me. Now, it's never, ever tell your spouse you don't love me. Why do we say it? We want him to say, yes, I do love you. Wrong. Mm-hmm. If you learn just this, it'll be worth it. What would happen? Every time I would tell him you don't love me, he'll think, she's my wife. She knows the real me. Maybe I don't love her. Mistake. Never too late to learn. Now, when he still tells me, what's this new thing you're doing? I give him my best smile. I say, you know you love me. You know you're crazy about me. And he <laughs> likes it and he's beginning to believe it. <sighs> second, second thing where we said, get somebody else to be mush be on your husband. In other words, someone else tell your husband, you're not his rabbi, you're his wife. And many other tips he gave on Shalom, it's in my books. He guided me in my Shalom, and I use those tips he guided me on other women. And it really it works. Because two people can all be exact, two clones exactly on the same level. So a person is a person more or less observant. I mean, Brokhaj and my husband is totally observant in every way now. I would never believe it in those days because he didn't like me to, you know, put on a shaitl and to wow. do. But now he's, believe me, he's more sadic than you can possibly imagine. So what I'm trying to say, it is very painful when one couple, one of the couples become more observant and the other one does not. And it does lead to a lot of friction. But again, with Abbot Israel, because Abbot Israel is also for your spouse. It's not just for the outside world. You have to love one another. So your spouse is also a Jew in love him or her. It's again, a sense of you and the respect. So I try to give him the respect that he deserves. And then I think from that, he, he reciprocated in kind. That, you know, that's very, very interesting because that was going to lead me to my next question. Like, how did your husband move from maybe not being so observant to being to observing all the mitzvahs? Because that's hard. That's, that's a big leap from one place to another. Extremely hard. And Rukhashem, my husband is a proud Sfadi guy. And you know, Sfadi, are very, you know, they have their, I don't say the word ego because that's not right. He has his pride. Yes. I would learn to nurture that pride, to give him that respect. Again, I'm going back to the word respect to respect him and to not do things that I know is going to not be right for him. 
and he appreciates that and he now he's totally okay with me doing all the things that I'm doing and he also does the things that I need him that I want him to do so that only would work when there's no clash and fighting and tears and reprimanding and trying to make him feel guilty that does not work and will and should not work I have to respect him he's my husband so people change over the years you know in many different ways Sometimes the husband becomes more observant, and that's much more difficult. When a woman comes and tells me, you know, that she's more religious than the husband, I say, you're lucky everything is in your hands. Tell us Mishpacha, the Kashas, Shabbos, it's all in a woman's hands. So it's more difficult when the husband becomes more observant, because he, how is he going to go with the woman who hasn't been to the mikvah? Right. So yes, you have to, it's just a question of reciprocal respect, and to really realize this is my husband, this is my wife. Hashem gave him to me, gave her to me. So my job in life is to be kind to that person, give respect to that person. And that's what makes Shalom Bais. That's what it is. It brings a bracha to the home. Because when you have Shalom Bais, you've got everything. If you don't have Shalom Bais, you've got nothing. People go into marriage sometimes with unrealistic expectations or they compare themselves to other people. How come her husband does that and my husband doesn't? You know, whatever your husband does, it's good for you. Maybe you don't know what the other one is doing. Other things that your husband doesn't do that you're glad he doesn't. So never ever look and try and compare yourself to others. Don't have unrealistic expectations. Whatever Hashem gave you is good for you. That's my advice to everybody. I really like that because that's that you hit it like right on the head. Whatever Hashem gave to you, it's good for you, right? Everybody has their own needs that that you know what they need to grow, how they need to 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 grow spiritually, how to grow personally, and Hashem puts that in your life. So absolutely, yes. Thank you, thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us on America's Top Rabbits. It was truly a pleasure to have you with us, and oh. may the learning we did today be for the Rafu Shalema for Itai Ben Ahuva and Yaakov David Natan Ben Sarahana, and also Rachel Bat Haya Alice and Dov Ben Maka Leia. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Shabbos and Mashiach. Now with Shalom Bais is going to bring Mashiach, so we're all going to be dancing together soon. Be Basimcha, do Basimcha. Amen, Amen. Thank you. Yeah.